welcome to the Global Composite Expert webinar series hosted by CDN Hub. This webinar series is to examine the history, present capability, and the future of composites with the goal of sharing the vast knowledge of composites that has been developed over the past several decades. And this webinar series is initiated by the leadership of Composite Manufacturing Simulation Center at Purdue University. And uh, we, we are located in this beautiful building called the Indiana Manufacturing Institute. Uh, when life returns to normal, we hope to welcome you to visit us. We launched the CDM Hub in 2013 with the mission to convene and serve the global composite community by creation, education, evaluation, and the sharing of resources for composite design and manufacturing. The CDM Hub provides a very powerful website called cdmhub.org for the community to collaborate and carry out this mission together. And we envision CDM Hub to be the premier resource for composite design and manufacturing. And this uh, webinar series one of the initiatives uh, CDM have started as a service to the global composite community. Uh, this webinar series are made available by the support of CDM Hub sponsors, uh, including Dassault Systems, Cytex Solve Group, MSC Software, through Digimite, Modex 3D. We greatly appreciate their generosity and also contribution to CDM Hub. We invite more organizations to join them and join us to support CDM Hub's mission of conveying and serving the global composite community. This webinar will be recorded and made available on CDM Hub, and an email will be sent to all attendees once the recorded video is available. And the presentation will last around 40 to 45 minutes and we'll have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. All attendees will be muted. Please submit your questions through the Q&A box. Uh, next, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Byron Pipes to introduce our distinguished speaker. Dr. Pipes, please. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you to this webinar series, and we have a special speaker today, Dr. Ramesh Talreja who is currently the Teneco Endowed Professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering and in Material Science at Texas A&M University. Prior to this appointment at Texas A&M, we all know that he held the professor position in aerospace engineering at Georgia Institute of Technology. His career, as we know, in composite materials research began at the Technical University of Denmark <clears throat> where he earned his Ph.D. in solid mechanics in 1974 and Doctor of Technical Services, Sciences rather, um, on his collected contributions to damage mechanics in 1985. He is currently a Science and Technology Policy Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, where he provides, um, as an outstanding engineer and scientist, his knowledge and skills to address today's most pressing societal challenges. As to composites, his scholarship has focused on the understanding of damage and failure of composite materials with the goal of reliable and cost-effective engineering design. He also serves on the editorial board of the International Journal of Damage Mechanics, and he edited Damage Mechanics of Composite Materials in the Composite Materials series for Elsevier in 1994, and was also editor of Polymer Matrix Composites, Volume 2 in Comprehensive Composite Materials, by, also by Elsevier. We're delighted to have Dr. Talreja join us today and present his lecture on the subject of damage mechanics. Dr. Talreja. Thank you, uh, Brian. Yeah, I'm really delighted that Professor Brian Pipes took the initiative to put together uh, this particular webinar series, and I'm really honored that he included me in this. Uh, I would like to, in this presentation, uh, bring together uh, two developments that have taken place. Uh, one, uh, which is sort of more classical, damage mechanics and failure analysis, but the uh, 
understanding of manufacturing induced defects uh, is something that has taken a different development because of the advances in computational technologies. So simulation is possible today of uh, manufacturing defects that was not possible earlier. So this particular uh, strategy of manufacturing sensitive design that I want to present to you uh, integrates those two aspects, damage and failure analysis and uh, 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 simulation of defects. So these are the topics I would like to cover. I will give you a very brief overview of uh, what are, what's the nature of defects uh, in a manufactured composite product. Uh, then uh, looking at those types of defects, uh, how do we integrate that knowledge and failure analysis into sort of a big picture that I would talk about. Uh, and that picture really is the ultimate goal of any engineering, which is to do cost uh, performance trade-off. Uh, then I'll go into uh, certain concepts uh, that are necessary to do this particular type of uh, work. Uh, one is the representative volume element. Again, this is not the classical one. The classical one is, uh, I think most of you would know, uh, is for determining average properties. But for failure analysis, one has to do a different type of RVE. And in doing so, uh, one has to make use of uh, certain statistical descriptors uh, that are properly suited to account for the manufacturing induced defects. Then the next step is to conduct uh, so-called virtual testing on the computer. Uh, having RVE is like having a specimen that you go in a laboratory and do testing on, but this particular RVE is, is the virtual specimen on which you do testing. And at the same time, uh, with computational uh, mechanics, you do failure analysis. Uh, so I'll describe uh, those uh, essential steps. I illustrate all of this with two simple examples that are familiar to most people. Uh, one is transverse cracking, and the other is uh, failure under actual compression of unidirectional composites. And then I'll conclude. So uh, manufacturing methods are many in uh, polymer matrix composites. Uh, earlier from the uh, manufacture of boards, glass fiber boards and such, uh, one was doing hand layup. And still in some cases, that is how uh, what does the manufacturing? There are variations of that. Rather than uh, you know pour the resin, you spray it, uh, or, or lay up the prepreg manually. In many cases, the automated methods are actually increasing uh, more and more, and becoming less and less uh, expensive. And in most cases, they are uh, based on the fiber direction. That is, the you, know, you have to be. Uh, sort of uh, taking the fiber orientation as the, the, the uh, goal for automated uh, laying off. So filament winding, pre-preg uh, layup, and, and pultrusion are the common examples of that. Various uh, molding methods that have developed over the years. Uh, the RTM is uh, sort of the classical one, it's variation, vacuum-assisted RTM, uh, resin infusion in various different ways, thermoforming, uh, the, the main point sort of uh, to uh, uh, recognize here is that any manufacturing method that is uh, controlled well will uh, give fewer manufacturing defects. Uh, and as you control the manufacturing more and more, typically the cost goes up. Uh, and it's also to do with uh, whether or not particular composite structure allows uh, uh, for process control. So uh, with this, I'll show you some uh, images. Uh, this is from the Sandia report of 2011, where they went around and looked at actually how wind turbine blades were being manufactured and took some pictures to show you how, uh, you know, things are sort of uh, not as advanced as in the uh, aerospace industry, it's simply because of the cost. Uh, so you are looking at this picture to the left is a hand layup of mats in the mold. On the right, you're looking at two parts of the mold that are being closed. Uh, and and uh, you can imagine that a lot of the uh, labor intensive 
uh, input in this uh, reduces the amount of control you can have uh, in uh, producing a quality product. Uh, here are some laboratory examples of uh, uh, intentionally trying to see how defects will come about. So on the top left, you see a case where uh, prepregs were uh, removed too early from the bag in which they were enclosed. So this way, many, uh, the, the moisture in the air uh, settled on the surface and diffused itself inside. And then during curing, uh, that moisture expanded to uh, those uh, voids that you see as dark areas. Uh, here you see a void, uh, typically uh, as air the pocket trapped between two layers. Uh, and then you can see the consequence of that uh, leading to debonding of uh, fiber from uh, it matrix around it. Here you see RTM because it's a low cost typically, with much less control. So in some cases you could have a lot of air bubbles left over and they become uh, essentially the undesirable uh, void-like entities and could be causing trouble. Uh, here's uh, again from uh, Sandia uh, report, the section of a wind turbine blade where you can see that uh, thick layers that were stacked on top of each other uh, on uh, curing uh, shrunk and caused uh, uh, disbond between the layers and uh, therefore delamination under service conditions. Here you see something that has been done in a, a laboratory environment, but following manufacturing uh, process as it is uh, sort of done in practice. And here are non crimp uh, fabric layers stacked on top of each other. Uh, and uh, after curing, once again, you see the waviness and uh, some probably some delamination as well. Uh, so I'll come to this particular example a bit later. Uh, joints are, uh, adhesive joints, as you know, are common in composites and often uh, the, the thermal expansion mismatch between parts that are being joined together can lead to uh, waviness of uh, uh, fibers close to the interfaces. So you see that's the situation here and the closer picture also shows a uh, thing here. So this is, uh, say, uh, some airfoil. The example is taken from wind turbine blade. Uh, you can see the joints are typically in the uh, leading edge, trailing edge, and between the spar, which in this case is the box girder, and the shell. Uh, and so a lot of these are joining going on. And control of this particular joint is very difficult to do because what's done is to put a paste-like uh, adhesive between uh, the two parts of the shell. And when you close the, the shell, the two parts, uh, the adhesive squeezes and takes uh, irregular shape. Here's a close-up of that. Uh, and I think I'll show you a better picture here. Uh, and you see the result of that is that between the uh, outer shell and uh, the adhesive that joins the lower uh, shell, is quite irregular, the clumps here and so on, missing adhesive here. So the defects are, uh, you know, uh, part of real life in composite materials for the most part, uh, in very few exceptional cases where uh, uh, cost is not of much concern, uh, that you can control the process completely and avoid defects. So uh, in this manufacturing sensitive design that I would describe to you, there are three essential steps. The first is to represent the internal structure of a composite when it has been uh, produced, uh, having uh, manufacturing defects. And because the nature of the defects is, is not deterministic, you had to do statistical simulation of that. Now, the novel part of uh, the approach that I have been taking uh, with my students is that uh, we want to quantify those defects. So with the statistical simulation, uh, we have added an aspect to that that will uh, come up with the defect severity as a measure of uh, the defect. And then our idea will be to connect that defect severity in the step three to performance measures. And in step two, you will do the, the virtual testing according to what you're looking for, fatigue, uh, static loading, what have you. So uh, this three-step process is, is sort of the uh, main uh, thrust of the uh, design strategy. Here's the workflow of uh, what uh, we would like to see in the future. I mentioned earlier the trade-off between cost and performance, which is right here. 
So in order to do that, we need to have manufacturing quantified. And my colleagues in, on the other side in the fluid mechanics are working very hard uh, on this aspect. Uh, people like me in solid mechanics uh, don't bother too much with that. Uh, we wait until they have finished uh, uh, doing their uh, modeling. And the uh, situation today is that uh, that modeling does not provide uh, a full picture of uh, what the microstructure or internal structure of the composite will be given processing parameters. Anyway, so uh, this is left for the future. Uh, what uh, I'm doing uh, and similar work uh, in the literature uh, in uh, failure analysis is to take that uh, manufactured composite, uh, characterize its internal material state and I have called that RIMS, which is real initial material state. And as uh, loading progresses, uh, the initial goes to current. So the material state evolves. And that evolution depends on the defect structure in the, um, in the microstructure. So there's a stationary part of the RIMS that does not evolve, obviously, uh, such as fibers and matrix, but defects become cracks and they evolve and they affect the performance. So that enters in a physical modeling exercise where other information of geometry, boundary conditions, loading comes as well. All that uh, uh, come, uh, leaves out as an output uh, uh, performance measures. Uh, and that could be for structural integrity, durability, damage tolerance, and taking those quantified measures and then the manufacturing process parameters uh, one would be able to sometime in the future, hopefully, uh, do this cost performance trade off. So that's the idea. So I'll do two examples, as I said earlier, that are very familiar to sort of illustrate the basic concepts, the approach, and so on. One example is that of uh, transfer cracking, which actually is uh, the, uh, should I say, in design, uh, the target, because that's the first mechanism in most cases that occurs. And you would want to, in many cases, just be sure that it does not uh, happen. So transverse cracking has been a lot of focus of a lot of studies. These images here show you that when you look at any instant in a cross section of a UD composite, you see a fiber debonded from a matrix, you see a crack in the matrix, and it may be that the debonding occurred first and uh, proceeded as a matrix crack and joined the next debond, or that in a resin rich pocket, a, a crack formed in the matrix went to the uh, fiber surface, debonded it, and proceeded that way. Uh, so those are the issues one can uh, uh, resolve uh, through failure analysis. Here's another example which I showed earlier, uh, where defect is playing a major role. So wires is one type of a defect and non-uniform distribution of fibers. Uh, that is to say clustered fibers and resin-rich pockets. Those are sort of the features of the, uh, uh, the uh, internal structure that in this case are important. Uh, here are uh, certain images that uh, show you that this early stage that I pointed to uh, develops into uh, a full crack. And the evidence of that comes when you increase the loading, in this case, horizontal. Uh, you see the thickening of that uh, dark area, which suggests that on one side, uh, the composite is separating from the other. So sort of a crack has formed here. So this is a failure mode we like to analyze. So this step, one of the three step process is then to construct the RVE. And as I said earlier, this is not the RVE that is uh, sort of uh, uh, taught in, in uh, maybe uh, courses in uh, universities. Uh, the original idea of the RVE, uh, which came from work by Hill primarily, was to see how for a heterogeneous body, you can uh, do averages of the internal uh, heterogeneous structure. Uh, that, that is a very benign type of a RVE, so to speak, uh, relatively easy to construct. But if you want to do failure analysis, where the internal structure should be representative of what manufacturing produced, then the RVE has to account for uh, certain features of the internal structure, uh, where, uh, which are important to producing uh, the damage. And those defects that I talked about, uh, uh, non-uniform distribution of fibers leading to clusters, resin-rich pockets, they had to be in the RVE from the perspective of their causing failure. So I'll illustrate to you how that is done. Uh, the manufacturing defects, uh, as I said before, in the RVE had, had to be put in a statistical way. So the RVE has to be uh, uh, 
uh, sort of generated through some statistical procedures, which I will describe uh, soon. Uh, so these are the two uh, uh, the defects that I mentioned, the non-uniformity that had to be captured. Uh, so the main thing is from the point of view of proceeding further is to how much of the internal uh, structure we should include in the RVE so it's represented to. So that is uh, uh, the question that is called, what's the minimum volume of RVE? So I'll discuss that. So here's an example of, say, you're looking at a, a cross section of a UD composite. A bigger picture here uh, shows that there's you know, a lot of non-uniformity. You do a close up and you see those aspects that I'm talking about, uh, clustering of fibers and resin rich pockets. So how do we quantify that? Uh, it has turned out that some work uh, Ripley did in, back in 1977 uh, is very useful here. He produced a so-called K function because he called it K. Uh, it formula is here, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. Uh, but essentially, uh, what is to be done is to take a certain uh, uh, represented to area A, a field of view, in which you uh, go to the non-uniform distribution of fibers and construct this a K function. So let me show what that is. So here's that picture again, and so you go to any uh, arbitrary fiber, draw circles of radius R, and plot that radius R value here. And the K function then does a statistic of uh, the neighborhood of, uh, uh, of that particular fiber. That is, where are the other fibers related to this one here? So what that does is to produce a, a K are curve that is characteristic of a certain pattern. So it's like a pattern recognition idea. If I give you one distribution of uh, uh, fibers, which is non-uniform, and another one that is non-uniform, these K curves will be able to show uh, differences between those. So if it's a uniform distribution, uh, the K uh, will, uh, will have a very different uh, appearance. That's not enough for quantification. So a G function has been proposed. What that does is essentially from here to derive the variation. That is how the interfiber distance is changing. And that when you plot that against the R, what you find is that for small values of R, that's in the closed neighborhood of uh, fiber, you have a lot of uh, uh, undulations. And as you go further and further, it stabilizes. What that says is that if you are doing this statistic, up to a certain point like this, 40, 45 microns, you have captured uh, the irregularities. If you go beyond that, you're adding information that is not uh, really doing any, uh, any more uh, useful uh, thing. And you want to have minimum size so that the, in computation, you don't waste too much uh, in doing analysis. So uh, how do we go about uh, quantifying this now? So that's where our novelty comes in. We are taking two different paths and I'll describe both to you. I'm calling that as RV construction type one and type two. In type one, which is more common in the literature, is you start out with a square window in which you place uh, fibers in a uniform pattern uh, with separation between surfaces uh, constant X uh, that's shown there. And then you shake it, it's called shaking method. And it's, uh, when you say shake it, you have to provide a certain algorithm for shaking. And that algorithm, then you can uh, uh, sort of embed your quantification. Now, what has been done in the literature is to just shake it so that it becomes uh, uh, non-uniform, but not worry about uh, the degree of non-uniformity. Uh, that's where we have done our contribution. So what we do is to uh, look at the maximum distance uh, a fiber can travel uh, when, or move uh, when uh, you shake it. And if, it, if you allow it to move that maximum distance and create through random generation of uh, numbers, uh, it's uh, new uh, positions, then the final product that you get here has the maximum non-uniformity. So we call that 100%. And then we reduce the size of uh, the, the circle in which you can, uh, can have the centroid of the fiber uh, take different random positions. And proportionately, then you say uh, it's not 100%, but 50% or 30%. So let me show you examples. Uh, of course, it depends on the fiber volume fraction. That is uh, what's the initial uh, distribution that you start out with. So let's say you start with 40% fiber volume fraction. With 100% non-uniformity, you look at, at a pattern like this. Uh, 
As you reduce the non-uniformity, it becomes more and more uniform. Obviously, at zero non-uniformity, you recover the uniform distribution. If there is uh, more space between fibers, so it's 30% 30, 30 fiber volume fraction, you have a uh, much uh, more irregular pattern at 100% non-uniformity and so on. Okay, the other type is uh, uh, where uh, I want to see what happens to the fibers that are initially in some, uh, say, fiber bundle in a, in a fixed position. And as you infuse the resin, how would they create a final pattern uh, or, uh, with, with non-uniformity? So here what we do is we go to the central fiber, make reference there, and then go radially out and consider all the rings uh, around it. So you're looking at the first ring here around it and uh, use polar coordinates uh, R and theta and uh, give the fibers mobility in the radial direction as well as in the theta direction. And those are the two uh, the variables put together, uh, provide the mobility in, that you give to this bundle. And if you give increasing mobility, it of course will spread out more and ha have less clusters. So the algorithm, uh, which is described in the, in the paper there, what it does is to spread out the fibers uh, the, from the outer regions. So uh, as you proceed and keep doing that until you come to a point where the distance from the central fiber to its neighbor is a certain minimum uh, prescribed distance because you want to have some resin there to put finite elements in there, minimum two. So this is the, the pattern that you generate when you specify those uh, uh, mobility uh, quantities, dr and d theta. Here's an example of a low fiber mobility, and you see it's very clustered. Uh, with a high fiber mobility, it's less clustered and begins to have resin-rich uh, uh, pockets. So that's sort of the, the idea. Now, uh, getting the minimum RVE is the next step before you do failure analysis. And the, uh, the idea that I actually described earlier is to get a certain statistic to calm down uh, so that if you uh, increase the size of the window, it does not add any further useful information. So here in this particular shaking method, there's a statistic, I don't have time to describe that, but the concept is clear that that statistic uh, uh, changes, varies, until you come to a certain point beyond which it's not changing. So that 200 uh, fibers in the window would be uh, the minimum size that you need to use. Uh, and that's uh, uh, the, the size of the window you put additional fibers around it to protect that window from uh, edge effects. So you are applying the uniform displacement to this RVE. The edge effects will be in this region. You go away from it and do your fade analysis in this region here. Uh, the other type uh, where the final pattern is not uh, uh, rectangular. So what is done is to uh, encircle it with a circle and then uh, uh, embed that uh, uh, that is called a cell, embed the cell in an outer region. Now, why? It's because this is not totally suited for applying boundary conditions. So it's done commonly in the literature, uh, not so commonly, but it, this idea is out there that you do embedded cell. So outer region is a homogenized composite. Uh, it's a straight boundaries, a, in this case, a square uh, region. And uh, then use the hill idea. The hill idea is that if I apply to the boundary, uh, uniform displacement, uh, and I get uniform traction resulting from it, then I'm fine. So if I reduce the size of this uh, outer region, uh, you see though this is the reduced size, it gives a non-uniform result. That is, if I apply uniform displacement, I get non-uniform traction. I keep increasing the size until I get to this equality of uniformity in both cases. So those are details you can find in papers if you wish. Now the failure analysis, I need to spend maybe a minute to explain uh, my philosophy. Uh, failure analysis is a uh, you know, legacy of what we have been doing for metals and so on, where uh, uniform conditions often exist. That's not the case here. And using stress analysis causes in my mind difficulty because stress is a tensor and you cannot uh, separate it so easily. So why, let me explain that. So here's a, a uniform, non-uniform pattern I'm applying a remote stress uh, sigma. If I go to a point like this, which is the polar point or close to the polar point, there's intersection of uh, the axis of loading to uh, 
on the, uh, the fiber, then typically I have uh, dilatational or close to dil dilatational stress state. What that means is that all three principal stresses are tensile and equal or nearly equal. That is, you will have only volume expansion here. If you go to a point like this here, then you get a mixed stress state. That is, say, this is a distortional. It has both uh, shape change as well as volume change. With energy, you can separate those two quite easily because energy is a scalar quantity. So if I look at the total strain energy, it's split into dilatational part and distortional part. The dilatational part here will become critical when the volume expansion takes a certain value. What that means is that volume has expanded at a certain point, the material cannot bear any further expansion and it bursts as a cavity or forms a cavity that bursts open. So we uh, discovered this mechanism back in 1996. I'll talk about that in the next slide. Uh, most uh, uh, people really look at only this uh, situation of distortion of energy and then describe it, it with von Mises stress criterion. Uh, I'm a firm believer of that uh, strategy leading to uh, problems of uh, fundamental nature. Okay, so here back to this particular point. Here's what happens, the cavity forms here. And we devised back in 1996 a method called poker chip method, which was actually taken from uh, uh, some research in rubber uh, uh, by Ghent. Uh, anyway, what the important point to mention here is that there's a method to independently assess uh, and find the critical value of dilatational energy density, which will cause this cavity. And this cavity is surrounded by a brittle region because there's no shear. And therefore, it expands like a, like a, should I say, burst opens, so to speak. The value of the dilatation energy density formula is here. And the value comes out to be, for epoxy, very small, 0.2 megapascal. What this means is there's no other mechanism is able to compete with this particular uh, mechanism. It's an energy dissipating mechanism, failure mechanism, and there's no other mechanism of crack formation that comes uh, close to that. So uh, this is sort of the first mechanism if its conditions are right, that is, it has dilatation energy density. Now this is going to take time to describe, so I'll refer you to the paper. Uh, so what we do essentially is to uh, look for the right conditions, uh, three principal stresses being equal. We plot the ratios of it, and at applied strain of approximately 0.3%, uh, the, the three principal stresses become nearly equal. And then we look at uh, how the uh, with the applied strain, the, uh, uh, the maximum dilatation energy and distortion energy values are changing. And we find that uh, before you get to this point, uh, you have already satisfied the minimum uh, 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 criterion. That's the criterion for minimum uh, energy density for dilatation. So that uh, happens in transverse crack formation. Here's the final result, which I think is uh, quite uh, logical and understandable. Uh, what is done is to do this uh, procedure uh, for statistical RBE formation, virtual testing, and then uh, do number of virtual tests like you do in a laboratory and get a, a, a scatter. So these are points are scatter points of virtual tests. And what is being plotted is that the mechanical strain that you apply to the virtual specimen and find the first, uh, uh, first point uh, of the loading uh, in, uh, that you have uh, uh, brittle cavi cavitation occurring. So what, uh, that value, what you see is that uh, just over 0.3% in this case, if it's a 60% volume fraction, which means there are higher, larger cl clusters. As you reduce the volume fraction, uh, clustering reduces, and therefore you have to do more uh, work, or sh should I say less probability of finding uh, a, a, a place where dilatation uh, energy density becomes critical. Anyway, uh, as you increase the non-uniformity, and this is sort of the new result, uh, so you are quantifying now this effect. So if you're a design engineer and you want to, uh, to assess uh, that your product has uh, much less control and therefore high level of non-uniformity, you will go to this uh, uh, value. Uh, if you think that it's a very well controlled with uniform distribution of fibers, then you go to this value. Okay, uh, this is a result which is uh, also of interest. Uh, it's approximate because it should have been 3D uh, 
uh, what is too deep. But anyway, I think it qualitatively explains a certain feature that is not intuitively obvious. If I use glass fibers in epoxy versus carbon fibers in epoxy, for the same clusters uh, of uh, fibers, uh, the initiation of uh, dilatation induced cavitation is earlier in carbon because of the high stiffness mismatch. Now, carbon fibers believed to be good in every sense, but that is really not the case here. Uh, so that's something also to point out. Uh, here's uh, another result which uh, sort of uh, uh, presents the same uh, overall result in a different way, where the clustering of the, the, the uh, fibers is here rather than non-uniformity measure. Now it's a clustering of fiber measure. So more uh, uh, clusters you have, uh, lower will be the applied strain at which you will cause uh, cavitation. We also done analysis what happens uh, to crack formation from cavitation point. Of course, it requires higher strain. Uh, so this is an initiation and that's the uh, progression to crack uh, formation. And you can see that uh, uh, with dispersed fibers, uh, the higher value is needed to, to cause cracking while clustered fibers uh, would do that earlier. So hopefully these are good design guidelines for uh, people concerned with uh, manufacturing. Okay, I'm gonna shift gear and go to another example, which is very different, but illustrates uh, the concepts uh, or this particular strategy. So we are looking at unidirectional composite under actual compression. And at some point, uh, uh, what happens uh, is that you form a kink band. Uh, this is now a classical result. Everybody knows about it. Uh, so I, this is what happens. At some point, uh, the fibers break along a certain, uh, in a certain direction or, or along a plane, and another set of fibers fail in a parallel plane. So between that two is what you say a kink band has formed because it's a kink here. And uh, uh, between those two planes, the fibers then undergo rotation. So uh, in Budyansky model, which is classical for this, uh, geometry constructed, has uh, uh, parameters uh, of initial fiber misalignment phi, uh, the rotation of the, the uh, uh, fibers within the, the king band, the phi sub s, and uh, this is the bandwidth, and beta is the uh, tilting angle of the uh, king band. Okay, using all that uh, with a refined analysis, uh, Budyansky produced this relationship that says, uh, what is the stress? Uh, that you apply at which you have rotation of the fibers. So it's, a, it's an academic result, uh, very exciting and all that. But you ask yourself, if you are designing and you don't have kink band to look at, if you don't want to have kink band, how do you get this sort of information in your design? So you had to do some estimates. Well, it turns out that uh, in 1983, the Budyansky model that came, uh, was actually generalization of something that uh, Argon, in a very intuitive manner, produced earlier in 1972. What he said was, if I if I have one fiber in a uniform uh, parallel fiber set uh, misaligned with that, this angle phi, what would uh, it, uh, it do, or what would it take to have this uh, misaligned fiber trigger? Uh, something that will lead to king band. And it's a remarkable uh, way of thinking about it because that's the only information you can reasonably have uh, when you have manufactured a product. So his formula is really, uh, uh, you would say, specialization of this formula. We will put beta equal to zero because the king band has not formed yet. Put phi s equal to zero because the fibers are not rotated yet. Uh, and then you get this result that uh, 10 years earlier, Argon produced in a much simpler way. And I'll show you that this result is very useful in doing uh, this type of uh, uh, analysis of failure that I'm talking about. So let's go to that. Uh, so this is work that uh, uh, has been done recently uh, by, uh, you know, interesting thing is that when you have students and they become professors and they have students and you can visit them anytime you want. So. I went to one of my uh, former students who was a professor in uh, Chalmers, and they told me what they were doing. And I'll describe that work to you. So what they were doing is uh, supported by Volvo. They were uh, producing uh, 
uh, thicker uh, uh, unidirectional composites using uh, king, uh, 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 bundles, non crimp bundles rather, uh, and then looking at, uh, as with certain uh, image analysis that they developed, looking at how much was the misalignment. And they were plotting the misalignment here, angle, uh, uh, with this frequency. So, and then we're fitting uh, Gaussian curves to that, going to very high level of uh, probability, at 95% or so, and picking up that angle. And that's the maximum uh, misalignment angle they were using in Argon's uh, formula and finding excellent uh, correspondence with the data, uh, failure compression data, failure data. Using Budiansky, uh, with estimating fiber rotation and all that, you were getting conservative results. Uh, but this was, was fit very well. For different batches, here are the correspondence, which is uh, sort of uh, uh, tells you that uh, the Argon formula worked uh, quite well. So I came into the picture and made the following observation. Argon, of course, was uh, trying to develop very simple uh, results by using a single fiber misalignment. In reality, you don't have that. You have clusters of fibers uh, misalignment. Misalign it's a misalignment in coordination, so to speak. So you have uh, Im images like this here, uh, this is just a sketch, is that uh, a bunch of fibers next to each other uh, become wavy and therefore misaligned. So uh, uh, inspired by some fraction mechanics analysis, I said, let's uh, uh, smear these together as ellipses, uh, like you could say area of influence of this, and then put those ellipses in a solid, uh, and uh, consider these to be sort of uh, elliptical cracks. Of course, they are not cracks, but you use a similar idea as you uh, as if these were cracks. So I constructed a, a measure of defect severity with three uh, parameters in it. Two uh, are the, uh, should I say, uh, smeared out ellipse uh, char characteristic values, area of the ellipse, uh, the uh, uh, minor uh, axis uh, length and orientation of the ellipse, and then the misalignment angle uh, maximum within the ellipse. Okay, so this defect severity measure uh, that was constructed actually worked out quite well. So details are in the picture, in the, in the references you can read on, on your own, hopefully. So essentially, uh, this is what was done. You take uh, uh, represented two images of uh, the manufactured product, uh, produce computer uh, generated images of that with uh, fiber misalignment, uh, turn them into elliptical regions, uh, go into uh, the finite element uh, uh, model, and then apply the failure analysis based on argon and some a uh, little bit more. And then you find which of the uh, elliptical regions uh, will be the first one to cause a compressive failure. And the correspondence was pretty good with the experimental data. Okay, so with this, I want to save some time for Q&A and, &A and uh, uh, essentially summarize what I have uh, presented uh, today. Uh, first point is that manufacturing defects are reality. Uh, you know, aerospace industry is still operating on something like arbitrary 2% uh, volume fraction of uh, voids. If you are less than that, you are okay. I think it's not gonna cut it. We have to live with uh, uh, defects. Uh, if you try to minimize defects, you can increase the cost and you don't know when to uh, get to the optimal. So that is the reality. The stress and failure analysis must incorporate defects appropriately, not like what we were doing back uh, two decades ago, uh, putting artificial defects and uh, doing testing. Testing is limited uh, physically, so we need to do virtual tests. Uh, the, the novelty of this approach I described to you is that I believe in quantification. So the defect severity is quantified, damage uh, mechanics is there in a very quanti quantitative manner, merge those two together to create a certain strategy for uh, failure analysis. Uh, and that is the manufacturing sensitive design. Now in future, what I see uh, happening is that uh, we will put all these uh, algorithms that I described and physical knowledge into a machine learning uh, process with artificial intelligence. So that's, you know, I'm approaching my retirement. I don't know if I will be able to do that, but hopefully uh, that will be the future direction of uh, the work. I put the, the references uh, of recent publications connected with this. You may want to look at those if you wish.
much for your attention. I sleep and went away. Uh, ready for any questions. Thank you. My name is Jonathan Goodsell, and we want to thank Professor Talraja for his excellent presentation. And I'll be fielding the questions. As a, as a reminder, please put your questions in the Q&A box, and we will, uh, we will ask those here to, to Professor Talraja. We have about 10 minutes uh, for, for the questions and answers. And so uh, we'll begin. One of the first questions we received, Professor Talraja, was about um, the case of random excitations. And in the case of random excitation, how would one estimate the onset and propagation of cracks and failure? Okay, now I did not quite uh, discuss uh, uh, random excitation. Uh, what I discussed was uh, a virtual test where you apply a uniform loading, which is not random excitation, but you could say constant amplitude type of excitation. Uh, you, you know, back in my PhD work in 1970, four, I think, uh, I did work on random excitation. So there are ways to connect the quantitative measures of random excitation to the consequence of that. But that, that part is just characterizing the loading as a, a random, not the failure uh, uh, as, as another random. You know, I mean, failure has its own randomness. And that's what I treated in my presentation today. Uh, the next step will be to connect uh, quantifying the randomness of the failure to the random applied loading. Uh, so I would not recommend using minor type of rules, but uh, there are much better procedures for characterizing random excitation for say, in the case of wind energy, uh, the wind, en wind loading is quite random. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Another question here about um with a number of questions all around uh, the RVE approach, and we'll try to, to lump some of those together. But the first, the first question is a basic question about getting the properties of materials, and of course, needing the properties of the constituents and the microstructure. This person asked the question, I, I know of the method to use a data sheet, or to, to find all of the mechanical properties of both fiber and matrix, or use a data sheet for some, and use testing for other properties, do you have a strategy in your experience that has proven effective for determining those, those constituent properties? Well, I'm a total believer of uh, material properties as defined uh, in the classical way. That is a material property is a property independent of the geometry of the specimen, uh, independent of the loading mode. So a material has a certain characteristic behavior that is captured in certain constants called material properties like uh, Young's modulus, Parsons ratio. Now in this approach that I described, in addition to those material properties, we need failure related material properties. And I'm very adamant about that. I think what's happening in the literature, unfortunately, is using fancier models like a cohesive zone model where you have material parameters appearing that there's no way to find them independently. Uh, the, the particular approach that I described, the material properties are dilatational energy density at cavitation formation. And that can be found by an independent test. But those tests are, that particular type of test is not standard yet. And it's not easy to do, but that's the way to go. So I know the, in, in the industry, you use those sheets of uh, manufacturer, man, manufacturing uh, a company giving you uh, data. No, that's not good enough for failure analysis. Thank you. And, and following on that uh, line of, of data and so on, someone raised the question of how could the machine learning approach potentially be applied in this general field of manufacturing and defect simulation. Can you comment on that? Yeah, interesting question. It's something that I'm working on right now. Uh, there are two parts to that. You know, uh, machine learning can be, in principle, can be used to uh, uh, sort of uh, characterize how a given manufacturing process is progressing so that you can intervene and 
change it to produce less defects. Okay, we are not that far yet. We are still struggling with physical modeling of manufacturing process. What is happening today in machine learning is that at some point when you say, I'm not get, go, getting anywhere with my physical modeling, then you take a computer and allow the computer to help you out. Uh, and, and that particular approach is called supervised machine learning. Uh, if you cannot do that, then you do unsupervised machine learning. I would say, let's not jump to unsupervised yet. Uh, let's do the supervised first. But we have not done that yet. Uh, there are only very few papers in the literature on uh, machine learning related to manufacturing process. Now, coming to machine learning that I talked about here in my concluding slide is something that I'm proposing will happen uh, where we do all this uh, uh, RVE algorithms and so on uh, uh, with respect to physical phenomena in a way that we can improve that process by having computer uh, do it for us. That is, we teach the computer, you know, machine learning, there are uh, several uh, processes there uh, that are really simple, but they are tedious that we humans uh, uh, are not willing to do. But all this is still in infancy. So I cannot give you a specific answer as to how to do that, other than to say that uh, there's, that's the direction in which we should be going. Let me take this a uh, take this a, in, a, in another approach. Someone raised the question that um, much of the industry is starting to show interest in thermoplastic matrix composites as opposed to thermoset matrix composites. Though thermosets are certainly still very very active, and the question was along the lines of how much of this, what parts, and so on, commenting on the applicability of these methods over into thermoplastic based materials. Yeah, very fair question. You know, uh, I, I did not include that discussion in the presentation because the data is not uh, as much. But most of what we have collected over the decades is with epoxy. Uh, so, uh, you know, this dilatation energy density value that I talked about is for epoxy. Thermoplastics are fantastic. I think there's in, uh, amazing things going on in manufacturing with thermoplastics. But we'll have to go uh, slow, uh, not just take what we have from epoxy and say with thermoplastic, all we do is uh, add some inelastic deformation to that. No, because the nature of the, the bond between fibers and thermoplastic is not the same as between uh, say glass or carbon fibers and epoxy. So uh, what I described cannot be directly used uh, in terms of quantitative numbers, uh, like the strain to formation of a transverse crack. Uh, but we'll have to do work in that direction using thermoplastic, gain some uh, data on which we try out these, these uh, modeling ideas. Very good. We have a question now going back to one of your early slides where you discussed process modeling and maybe uh, fluid mechanics type modeling feeding into the damage modeling and solid mechanics. And this is a question from perhaps a process modeler who asks, what can process modelers do to support damage modeling? Are there particular parameters coming out of the process modeling community that if, uh, if developed or focused on would provide particular utility in the failure damage performance prediction world? Yeah, excellent question. You know, this is where we had to work together. Uh, so for instance, if I tell you that I'm interested in uh, transverse crack formation, uh, and I'm doing this, should I say, artificial uh, RVE generation because I don't know what manufacturing actually would produce. So if you uh, are on the side of manufacturing process modeler, you need to try to tell me uh, what are the end product internal uh, characteristics that you can expect. So if I, if I give, if you take certain processing parameters, uh, say distribution of pressure, temperature, uh, and, and all that. And you say, if you, with, with those numbers, you're gonna get uh, fiber distributions that are like these. Then I can use those in my RVE construction rather than do some artificial things that I described. Because, you know, at this point, I just want to understand how irregularities of fiber distribution affect uh, 
uh, formation of a transverse crack. So I do, uh, you know, some quantitative way to systematically see those effects. But this is in vacuum. That is, I don't know how, if I change the manufacturing parameters, how the initial conditions will change. So that's where my process modeler colleagues will have to, uh, you know, join hands with us. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. And uh, as a number of questions involve uh, RVE, and you made the, you made that, that point very, very well, but this selection of RVE is a little bit different than perhaps the traditional um, homogenization, dehomogenization RVE. Uh, one of the, one of the, the, the participants asked, asked you to comment, if you would, on, uh, again, on the difference between RVE for non-damaged situations and RVEs for damaged situations and provide any guidelines to practitioners, rules of thumb, so on, to, to, to clarify or make sure they're, that they're doing the RVE process for damage correctly. Yeah, but that's, that is really my hope, you know? So uh, for instance, let me see if I can go to a slide where, to illustrate this very quickly. No, it's not there. Uh, one of the final results. Yeah. So let's say that uh, I'm looking at the, the top curve at 0.5, 3% uh, uh, failure. That, is, that will be for uniform fiber distribution, right? So as I increase the non-uniformity, uh, that particular uh, design value of failure initiation falls. So this is the type of guidance you need. You know, so you make an assessment, you say to yourself, okay, given a certain volume fraction of fibers, I have a well-controlled process. It is as good as uh, uniform fiber distribution. Then I take uh, that value, 0.5 some percent. But if it's, uh, it's gonna be uh, non-uniform, then I actually gain something. But this gain is from the point of view of initiating uh, debonding, or more correctly, initiating cavitation. But if you have other uh, damage mechanism, you're not applying transverse uh, tension, but you're applying transverse compression, the picture will change. And I don't have time to go in all uh, five, there are five basic modes of uh, damage or failure for unidirectional composites. So one has to make, as a good designer, one has to see, you know, which is my main loading mode and therefore main failure mode, and then take this th these type of results as guidelines. The webinar is recorded and it will be available on the website. If you already have email address with us, we will send the link to you. Uh, with this, and we will close this webinar, and uh, thank you all for participating. Thank you.